Virtuous Israelis versus evil Arabs Another moral argument portrays Israel as a country that has sought peace at every turn and showed great and noble restraint even when provoked. The Arabs, by contrast, are said to have acted with deep wickedness and indiscriminate violence. This narrative is endlessly repeated by Israeli leaders and by American apologists for Israel such as Alan Dershowitz and the New Republic editor-in-chief Martin Peretz. Israel, according to Peretz, adheres closely to a doctrine called purity of arms, which means that everything reasonable must be done to avoid harming civilians, even if that entails additional risks to Israeli soldiers. Moreover, he maintains that Israel has for years vacillated between responding to terror with exquisitely calibrated force and pacifying terrorists by giving them some of what they want. While its Arab enemies are part of the very same terror that was launched on us on the 11th of September, 8. The IDF, according to Ariel Sharon and Ehud Olmert, among others, is the most moral army in the world. This description of Israeli behavior is yet another myth, another element in what Meron Benvenisti, the former deputy mayor of Jerusalem, calls Israel's sacred narrative. Israeli scholarship shows that the early Zionists were far from benevolent toward the Palestinian Arabs. The Arab inhabitants did resist the Zionists' encroachments, sometimes killing Jews and destroying their homes. But this resistance would be expected given that the Zionists were trying to create their own state on Arab lands. Were I an Arab? Ben-Gurion Kandidi remarked in June 1937, I would rebel even more vigorously, bitterly, and desperately against the immigration that will one day turn Palestine and all its Arab residents over to Jewish rule. The Zionists responded vigorously and often ruthlessly, and thus neither side owns the moral high ground during this period. This same scholarship also reveals that the creation of Israel in 1948 involved explicit acts of ethnic cleansing, including executions, massacres, and rapes by Jews. Of course, Zionist leaders did not tell their troops to and murder and rape Palestinians. But they did advocate using brutal methods to remove huge numbers of Palestinians from the land that would soon be the new Jewish state. Consider what Ben Gurion wrote in his diary on Yanuri 1, 1948, at a time when he was involved in a series of important meetings with other Zionist leaders about how to deal with the Palestinians in their midst. There is a need now for strong and brutal reaction. We need to be accurate about timing, place, and those we hit. If we accuse a family, we need to harm them without mercy, women and children included. Otherwise, this is not an effective reaction. There is no need to distinguish between guilty and not guilty. It is hardly surprising that this sort of guidance from the Zionist leadership Ben Gurion was summarizing the emerging policy led Jewish soldiers to commit atrocities. After all, we have seen this pattern of behavior in many wars, fought by many different peoples. Regardless, the occurrence of atrocities in this period undercuts Israel's claim to a special moral status. Israel's subsequent conduct toward its Arab adversaries and its Palestinian subjects has often been severe belying any claim to morally superior conduct. Between 1949 and 1956, for example, Morris estimates that Israeli security forces and civilian guards and their mines and booby traps killed somewhere between 2,700 and 5,000 Arab infiltrators. Some of them were undoubtedly bent on killing Israelis. But according to the available evidence, the vast majority of those killed were unarmed. The overwhelming majority had infiltrated for economic or social reasons, Morris notes that this free fire policy led to a series of atrocities against the infiltrators. These kinds of acts were not anomalous. The IDF murdered hundreds of Egyptian prisoners of war in both the 1956 and 1967 wars. In 1967, it expelled between 100,000 and 260,000 Palestinians from the newly conquered West Bank and drove 80. 000 Syrians from the Golan Heights, when the victims of these ethnic cleansings tried to sneak back to their homes, often unarmed. Israelis sometimes shot them on sight. Amnesty International estimates that between 1967 and 2003, Israel destroyed more than 10,000 homes in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Israel was also complicit in the massacre of innocent Palestinians by a Christian militia at the Sabra and Shatila refugee camps following its invasion of Lebanon in 1982. An Israeli investigatory commission found Defense Minister Ariel Sharon to bear personal responsibility for these atrocities by allowing the Phalangists to enter the camps. While the commission's willingness to hold a top official like Sharon accountable is admirable, we should not forget that Israeli voters subsequently elected him Prime Minister. Israel has now controlled the West Bank and Gaza for 40 years, Mac Ingat. As the historian Perry Anderson notes, the longest official military occupation of modern history, Deg. When the occupation began, Benny Morris explains, Israelis like to believe and tell the world that they were running an enlightened and benign occupation, 
qualitatively different from other military occupations the world had seen. The truth was radically different. Like all occupations, Israel's was founded on brute force, repression and fear, collaboration and treachery, beatings and torture chambers, and daily intimidation, humiliation, and manipulation during the First Intifada, 1987-91. For example, the IDF distributed truncheons to its troops and encouraged them to break the bones of Palestinian protesters. The Swedish branch of the Save the Children organization released a thousand-page report in May 1990 that detailed the effects of that conflict on the children in the occupied territories. It estimated that 23,600 to 29,900 children required medical treatment for their beating injuries in the first two years of the First Intifada. Moreover, it estimated that almost one-third of the children were 10 years or under, one-fifth were five and under, more than four-fifths had been beaten on their heads and upper bodies, and at multiple locations, and almost one-third of the children sustained broken bones, including multiple fractures. Ehud Barak, the IDF's deputy chief of staff during the first intifada, said at the time, we do not want children to be shot under any circumstances. When you see a child you don't shoot, nevertheless, save the children estimated that 6,500 to 8,500 children were wounded by gunfire during the first two years of the intifada. Regarding the 106 recorded cases of child gunshot deaths, the report concluded that almost all of them were hit by directed not random or ricochet gunfire. Almost 20% suffered multiple gunshot wounds. About 12% were shot from behind. 15% of the children were 10 years or younger. Most children were not participating in a stone-throwing demonstration when shot. And nearly one. Fifth of the children were shot dead while at home or within 10 meters of their homes. Israel's response to the second intifada, 2000-05, was even more violent. Leading the Israeli newspaper Haaretz to declare that the IDF, is turning into a killing machine whose efficiency is or inspiring yet shocking the idf fired one million bullets in the first days of the uprising which is hardly a measured response over the course of that uprising israel killed 3386 palestinians while 992 israelis were killed by the palestinians which means that israel killed 3.4 palestinians for every israeli lost among those killed were 676 Palestinian children and 118 Israeli children. Thus, the ratio of Palestinian to Israeli children killed was 5.7 to 1. Of the 3,386 Palestinian deaths, 1,815 were believed to be bystanders, 1,008 were killed while fighting the Israelis, and the circumstances of 563 deaths are unknown. In other words, well over half of the Palestinian fatalities appear to have been non-combatants. A similar pattern holds on the Israeli side, where 683 of its 992 deaths were civilians. The remaining 309 were military. Israeli forces have also killed several foreign peace activists, including a 23-year-old American woman crushed by an Israeli bulldozer in March 2003. Yet, yet the Israeli government rarely investigates these civilian deaths, much less punishes the perpetrators. These facts about Israel's conduct have been amply documented by new Maris human rights organizations, including prominent Israeli groups, and are not disputed by fair-minded observers. And that is why four former officials of Shin Bet, the Israeli domestic security organization con, emmed Israel's conduct during the second intifada in November 2003. One of them declared, we are behaving disgracefully, and another termed Israel's conduct patently immoral. A similar pattern can be seen in Israel's response to the escalation in violence in Gaza and Lebanon in 2006. The killing of two Israeli soldiers and the capture of a third by Hamas in June 2006 led Israel to reoccupy Gaza and launch airstrikes and artillery fire that destroyed critical infrastructure, including the electric power station that provided residents of Gaza with half of their electricity. The IDF has also killed hundreds of Palestinians since moving back into Gaza, many of them children. This dire situation led the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Louise Arbour, to proclaim in November 2006 that the violation of human rights in this territory is massive. Likewise, when Hezbollah units crossed the Israeli-Lebanese border in July 2006 and captured two IDF soldiers and killed several more, Israel unleashed a bombing campaign that was designed to inflict massive punishment on Lebanon's civilian population by destroying critical infrastructure like roads, bridges, gas stations, and buildings. More than 1,000 Lebanese died, most of them innocent civilians. As discussed in Chapter 11, this response was both strategically foolish and a violation of the laws of war. In short, 
there is little basis for the often heard claim that Israel has consistently shown great restraint in dealing with its adversaries. An obvious challenge to this point is the claim that Israel has faced a mortal threat throughout its history, both from rejectionist Arab governments and from Palestinian terrorists. Isn't Israel entitled to do whatever it takes to protect its citizens? And doesn't the unique evil of terrorism justify continued US support, even if Israel often responds harshly? In fact, this argument is not a compelling moral justification either. Palestinians have used terrorism against their Israeli occupiers, as well as innocent third parties. Their willingness to attack civilians is wrong and should be roundly condemned. This behavior isn't it surprising, however, because the Palestinians have long been denied basic political rights and believe they have no other way to force Israeli concessions. As former Prime Minister Barack once admitted, had he been born a Palestinian, he would have joined a terrorist organization. If the situation were reversed and the Israelis were under Arab occupation, they would almost certainly be using similar tactics against their oppressors, just as other resistance movements around the world have done, indeed. Terrorism was one of the key tactics that the Zionists used when they were in a similarly weak position and trying to obtain their own state. It was Jewish terrorists from the infamous Eigen, a militant Zionist group, who in late 1937 introduced into Palestine the now familiar practice of placing bombs in buses and large crowds. Benny Morris speculates that the Arabs may well have learned the value of terrorist bombings from the Jews, registered sign between 1944 and 1947. Several Zionist organizations used terrorist attacks to drive the British from Palestine and took the lives of many innocent civilians along the way. Israeli terrorists also murdered the UN mediator Count Folk Bernadotte in 1948. Because they opposed his proposal to internationalize Jerusalem, perpetrators of these acts were not isolated extremists. The leaders of the murder plot were eventually granted amnesty by the Israeli government and one of them was later elected to the Knesset. Another terrorist leader, who approved of Bernadotte's murder, but was not tried, was future Prime Minister Yitzhak Shamir. He openly argued that neither Jewish ethics nor Jewish tradition can disqualify terrorism as a means of combat, rather, terrorism had a great part to play in our war against the occupier Britain. Nor did Shamir express regrets about his terrorist past, telling an interviewer in 1998 that had I not acted as I did, it is doubtful that we would have been able to create an independent Jewish state of our own ethics. Of course, Menachem Begin, who headed the Eigen and later became Prime Minister, was one of the most prominent Jewish terrorists in the years before Israeli independence. When speaking of Begin, Prime Minister Levi Eshkol often referred to him simply as the terrorist. To degrees the Palestinians' use of terrorism is morally reprehensible today, but so was the Zionists' re reliance on it in the past. Thus, one cannot justify American support for Israel on the grounds that its past or present conduct was morally superior. Another possible line of defense is that Israel does not purposely target non-combatants, while Hezbollah and the Palestinians do aim to kill Israeli civilians. Moreover, the terrorists who strike at Israel use civilians as human shields, which regrettably leaves the IDF no choice but to kill innocent civilians when it strikes at its deadly foes. These rationales are not convincing either. As discussed in Chapter 11, the IDF targeted civilian areas in Lebanon, and there is little evidence that Hezbollah was using civilians as human shields. While there is also no evidence that it has been official Israeli policy to kill Palestinian civilians, the IDF has often failed to take care to avoid civilian casualties when fighting against groups like Hamas and Islamic Jihad. The fact that Hezbollah and the Palestinians target civilians does not entitle Israel to jeopardize civilian lives by using disproportionate force. There is no question that Israel is justified in responding with force to the violent acts by groups like Hamas and Hezbollah. But its willingness to use its superior military power to inflict massive suffering on innocent civilians casts doubt on its repeated claims to a special moral status. Israel may not have acted worse than many other countries, but it has not acted any better. Camp David myth the portrayal of Israel as primed for peace and the Palestinians as bent on war is reinforced by the standard interpretation of the Clinton administration's Shine's failed effort to complete the Oslo peace process. According to this story, Prime Minister Barack offered the Palestinians almost everything they wanted at Camp David in July 2000, but Arafat, still determined to derail the peace process and eventually destroy Israel, rejected this generous offer and instead launched the Second Intifada in late September 2000. Israel accepted and Arafat rejected an even more generous proposal the so-called Clinton parameters put forth by President Clinton on 23 December 2000, providing further evidence that he had no interest in peace. In this story, the failure of the peace process was almost entirely Arafat's fault. Israel was eager to make peace, but could not find a reliable partner 
confirming Abba Ibn's famous quip that the Arabs never miss an opportu, niti to miss an opportunity, this account also implies that neither Israel nor the United States bears responsibility for the continued conflict and bol ceased as the argument that Israel was correct in refusing to make concessions to the Palestinians as long as Arafat was in charge. There is only one problem with this widely held version of events, it is not correct. Although Barak deserves credit for being the first indeed, the only Israeli leader to offer the Palestinians their own state, the terms he offered them at Camp David were far from generous. To start, it seems clear that Barak's best offer at Camp David promised the Palestinians in dire control of Gaza and eventual control of 91% of the West Bank even so. There were major problems with this offer from the Palestinians' perspective. Israel planned to keep control of the Jordan River Valley, roughly 10% of the West Bank, for between 6 and 21 years different accounts of the negotiations vary on this point. Which meant that the Palestinians would be given immediate control over no more than 81% of the West Bank, not 91%. The Palestinians, of course, could not be sure that Israel would ever relinquish control of the Jordan River Valley. In addition, the Palestinians had a slightly more expansive definition of what constituted the West Bank than the Israelis did. This difference, which amounted to roughly 5% of the territory in question, meant that the Palestinians saw themselves immediately getting 76% of the West Bank and, if the Israelis were willing to surrender the Jordan River Valley at some future date, maybe 86%. What made this deal especially difficult for the Palestinians to accept was the fact that they had already agreed in the 1993 Oslo Accords to recognize Israeli sovereignty over 78% of the original British mandate from their perspective. They were now being asked to make another major concession and accept at best 86% of the remaining 22%. To make matters worse, the final Israeli proposal at Camp David in the summer of 2000 would not have given the Palestinians a continuous piece of sovereign territory in the West Bank. The Palestinians maintained that the West Bank would have been divided into three cantons separated by Israeli territory. Israelis dispute this claim, but Barak himself acknowledges that Israel would have maintained control of a razor-thin wedge of territory running from Jerusalem to the Jordan River Valley to degrees this wedge, which would completely bisect the West Bank, was essential to Israel's plan to retain control of the Jordan River Valley. Thus, the Palestinian state proposed at Camp David would have been composed of either two or three distinct cantons in the West Bank, and Gaza, which is itself separated from the West Bank by Israeli territory. Barak later said that the Palestinian areas on the West Bank could have been connected by a tunnel or bridge, while Gaza and the West Bank would have been connected by a travel corridor with regard to the thorny issue of Jerusalem. Barak's proposal to divide the city was a major step in the right direction. Nonetheless, the Palestinians were not offered full sovereignty in a number of Arab neighborhoods in East Jerusalem, which made the proposal significantly less attractive to them. Israel would also have kept control over the new Palestinian state's borders, its airspace, and its water resources, and the Palestinians would be permanently barred from building an army to defend themselves. It is hard to imagine any leader accepting these terms. Certainly no other state in the world has such curtailed sovereignty, or faces so many obstacles to building a workable economy and society. Given all this, it is not surprising that Barack's former foreign minister, Shlomo Benami, who was a key participant at Camp David, later told an interviewer, if I were a Palestinian I would have rejected Camp David. As well, the common claim that Arafat launched the second intifada in late September 2000 either to enhance his leverage in the negotiations, or to destroy the peace process itself does not stand up against the evidence either. He continued negotiating with the Israelis and the Americans after Camp David, and he even visited Prime Minister Ehud Barak's home a few nights before the violence broke out. According to Charles Enderlin, a French journalist who has written an important book on the failure of these negotiations. The two leaders were uncharacteristically friendly and optimistic about the negotiations that evening. Deg moreover, the former head of Shin Bet, Ami Ailen, has stated that Arafat neither prepared nor triggered the Intifada exclamation point. 3. The so-called Mitchell Commission, headed by former US Senator George Mitchell and charged with restarting the peace process, reached the same conclusion. The second intifada broke out shortly after Ariel Sharon visited the Temple Mount, Judaism's most holy site, on the 28th of September 2000. He had to be accompanied by more than a thousand Israeli police, because Muslims coincided that same site, the location of the Al-Aqsa Mosque, to be the third holiest site in Islam. But Sharon's provocative move was only the precipitating cause, not the root cause, of the violence. Trouble had been brewing among the Palestinians well before Sharon's visit, and key individuals on both sides recognized the danger. In fact, 
Palestinian leaders asked American and Israeli officials to bar Sharon's visit precisely because they anticipated a violent reaction and wanted to prevent it. Part of the problem was the Palestinians' growing dissatisfaction with the Arafat, whose corrupt leadership had done little to improve their lives, much less deliver a state. But the main cause was Israel's provocative policies in the occupied territories, compounded by its harsh response to the demonstrations that immediately followed Sharon's visit. One Ben. Ami is exactly right that the Second Intifada did not start merely as a tactical move. It erupted out of the accumulated rage and frustration of the Palestinian masses at the colossal failure of the peat process since the early days of Oslo to offer them a life of dignity and well-being, and at the incompetence and corruption of their own leaders in the Palestinian Authority. The Palestinians' frustrations are not hard to fathom. Between the start of the Oslo peace process in September 1993 and the outbreak of the Second Intifada seven years later, Israel confiscated more than 40,000 acres of Palestinian land, built 250 miles of bypass and security roads, established 30 new settlements, and increased the settler population in the West Bank and Gaza by almost 100,000, which effectively doubled that population. Dead the Israelis also reneged on promises to transfer territory back to the Palestinians and created a system of checkpoints that sharply reduced the Palestinians' freedom of movement and badly damaged their economy. The Palestinians were primed to explode by 2000, and when they did, the Israelis unleashed their superior firepower with scant restraint. The IDF, as noted, fired more than a million bullets in the first few days of the uprising. Although Arafat did not launch the second intifada, he exploited the resulting violence in a foolish attempt to enhance his bargaining position. Not only did this move make Barak less willing to cut a deal, but it also damaged Barak standing with the Israeli electorate and paved the way for Sharon's election in February 2001. Arafat's attempt to leverage the uprising also delayed the negotiations, which meant that the lame duck Clinton administrator Sharon had even less time in which to complete the process. Some argue that Arafat's ultimate goal in manipulating the violence was to erase Israel from the map. That was certainly his goal when he first emerged on the world stage in the 1960s. But he recognized by the late 1980s that there was no way that the Palestinians could make Israel go away. Arafat went to some lengths in the 1990s certainly by participating in the Oslo peace process to make clear that he accepted Israel's existence and that his struggle with Israel was over control of the occupied territories. Not all of historic Palestine when Camp David failed and the second intifada began. Almost all of Israel's key intelligence figures believed that Arafat accepted Israel's existence and merely sought a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza furthermore. As the Middle East specialist Jeremy Pressman points out, if Arafat and the Palestinians were determined to elim in at Israel, they would have accepted Barak's offer and used the new state as a launching pad for the elimination of Israel, but instead they negotiated as if they expected to abide by any agreements and live for the long term within the framework of a two-state solution. Finally, the oft-repeated claim that Arafat rejected the December 2000 Clinton parameters, which did improve on Barack's last offer at Camp David, is also wrong. The official Palestinian response thanked Clinton for his continued efforts, declared that considerable progress had been made, asked for clarification on some points, and expressed reservations about others. The Israeli government also had its own reservations about the proposal, which Barack outlined in a 20-page single-space document. Thus, both the Palestinians and the Israelis accepted the Clinton parameters and saw them as the basis for continued negotiation, but neither side accepted them in toto. The White House spokesman Jake Seward made just this point on the 3rd of January, 2001, when he said that both sides have now accepted the president's ideas with some reservations. And Clinton confirmed this point in a speech to the Israel Policy Forum for days later exclamation point, for negotiations between Israelis and Palestinians continued at Taba, Egypt, until late January 2001, when Ehud Barak, not Arafat, broke off the talks. With elections in Israel imminent and public opinion there running strongly against the talks, Barak felt that the clock had run out on him. His successor, Ariel Sharon, who was adamantly opposed to the Oslo peace process, as well as the Clinton peremptos, refused to resume negotiations despite repeated Palestinian requests. We will never know if peace was within sight by early 2001. But the charge that Arafat and the Palestinians rejected a last chance for peace and chose violence over reconciliation is false. Supporting Israel is God's will there is a final moral claim that some say justifies the close embrace between the United States and Israel. As discussed in more detail in Chapter 4, some evangelical Christians, especially so-called Christian Zionists, view the establishment of the Jewish state as the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. 
Genesis says that God gave Abraham and his descendants the land of Israel. By colonizing the West Bank, Jews are merely taking back what God gave them. Some Christians also see the creation of a greater Israel as a key event leading to the end-time final battle depicted in the New Testament's book, The of Revelation. Both perspectives imply that Israel deserves U.S. support not because it is a democracy, an underdog, or a morally superior society, but because backing Israel is God's will. This line of argument undoubtedly appeals to some fervently religious individuals, but anticipating Armageddon is not a sound basis for making American foreign policy. Church and state are separate in the United States, and the religious opinions of any group are not supposed to determine the country's foreign policy. It is also an odd reading of Christian ethics to support the powerful Israeli state in its mistreatment of dispossessed Palestinians and its suppression of their rights. What do the American people want? The six moral arguments that we have just examined underpin the broader claim that the real basis of U.S. support for Israel is the American people's enduring identification with the Jewish state. The columnist Jeff Jacoby of the Boston Globe writes that solidarity with Israel is an abiding feature of American public opinion. Because the American people are pro-Israel, the American government is pro-Israel. And because Americans so strongly support Israel in its conflict with the Arabs, American policy in the Middle East is committed to Israel's defense, as the AIPAC spokesman Josh Block said on the eve of its 2007 policy conference. There's one issue that is, support for the US relationship with Israel that brings everyone together, in fact. He argued that all trends indicate that Americans understand quite clearly that the basic values we celebrate are reflected in only one country in the Middle East our ally Israel for this claim, however widely believed, does not stand up to close inspection. There is a degree of cultural affinity between the United States and Israel, based in part on the shared Judeo-Christian tradition. There is also no question that many Americans look favorably on Israel because it is a demic racy, because of the history of anti-Semitism, and because they sympathize with Israel in its fight against Palestinian terrorism. But the common roots of Judaism and Christianity have hardly been a reliable source of amity between Jews and Christians in the past Deg not only have Christians waged brutal wars against each other, but they have also been the primary perpetrators of violent anti-Semitism in previous centuries. And some fundamentalists, including Christian Zionists, still regard the conversion of Jews as an impotent evangelical objective by itself. Therefore, this cultural affinity cannot account for the consistent level of U.S. support or even the generally favorable attitudes that many Americans express toward the Jewish state. As will become clear in later chapters, the American people are inclined to support Israel in part because its supporters in the United States cultivate sympathy by stifling criticism of Israel while simultaneously portraying it in a favorable light. Indeed, there is much more criticism of Israel's actions in Israel itself than there is in America. If there were a more open and candid discussion about what the Israelis are doing in the occupied territories, and about the real strategic value of Israel as a U.S. ally, there would be much less sympathy for Israel in the American public. Nonetheless, the degree of public support for Israel and for specific Israeli policies should not be overstated. Although the American people have favorable perceptions of Israel and clearly support the existence of a Jewish state, support for Israel is not especially deep. Most Americans also recognize that the United States pays a price for its unyielding support of Israel. For example, the Pew Research Center for the People and the Press has been asking Americans for many years whether they sympathize more with Israel or the Palestinians. There has always been much more sympathy for Israel, but from 1993 through 2006, the number went above 50% only it was 52% during the second Lebanon war in 2006, and was 5146 once as low as 37% in July 200 regarding the consequences of US support for Israel. A Pew survey conducted in November 2005 found that 39% of the American public said that it was a major cause of global discontent. Among opinion leaders, the numbers were substantially higher. Indeed, 78% of members of the news media, 72% of military leaders, 72% of security experts, and 69% of foreign affairs specialists believe that backing Israel seriously damages America's image around the world. A Newsweek poll re Least a few weeks after the 11th of September attacks found that 58% of the respondents believed that U.S. support for Israel was a factor in Osama 148 bin Laden's decision to attack America. The American people are considerably more critical of some Israeli AC shines than U.S. politicians are, and the public clearly supports taking a hard-nosed approach to dealing with Israel when they think it is in the national interest to do so. 
As we explain in Chapter 7, a survey in the spring of 2003 showed that 60% of Americans were willing to withhold aid to Israel if it resisted U.S. pressure to settle its conflict with the Palestinians. In fact, 73% said the United States should not favor either side in the conflict! Exclamation point. 42 two years later, the Anti-Defamation League found that 78% of Americans believed that Washington should favor neither Israel nor the Palestinians. Andrew Kohat, the director of the Pew Research Center for the People and the Press, points out that average Americans see shades of gray in the Middle East conflict, and their sympathies notwithstanding, they favor a neutral role for the United States. Unlike their leaders, the American people displayed a tough-minded approach to dealing with Israel during the Lebanon War in 2006. As discussed in Chapter 11, polls showed that slightly more than half of the public thought that Israel was either equally responsible or mainly responsible for the war. And in at least two polls more than half of the respondents said that the United States should not take sides, deg. But the United States emphatically took Israel's side in Lebanon, as it has in every recent conflict involving Israel. This enthusiastic and unconditional support cannot be explained by the generally favorable opinion of Israel held by most Americans. Conclusion The moral or strategic arguments commonly invoked by Israel's backers cannot account for America's remarkable relationship with the Jewish state over the past three decades. This is especially true for the post-Cold War period, when the strategic rationale largely evaporated and the moral rationale was badly undermined by Israeli behavior in the occupied territories. Yet the relationship continued to grow and deepen. Some Americans surely do not find this situation anomalous as they sincerely believe that there are powerful moral and strategic reasons behind U.S. support for Israel. Because the essential facts in this story are so at odds with this perspective, it is hard to imagine that the number of true believers is large enough to account for America's exceptional relationship with the Jewish state. We are left with a puzzle. Either a relatively small number of true believers are exerting a disproportionate influence on U.S. foreign policy, or they have managed to persuade lots of other people especially key politicians and policymakers that these flawed rationales are in fact correct. Because the strategic and moral case is increasingly weak, something else must be behind the striking pattern of ever-increasing US support. We address that issue in the next chapter.